Hello and welcome to our first practice problem in module nine. Here we're going to be looking at a single population mean, a one tail test where we know what the population standard deviation is. Now, this is really a simplifying assumption. Under normal circumstances, we wouldn't always have access to the population standard deviation. In fact, it's not until module 11 where we actually will start to do hypothesis testing on that unknown population parameter. Because just like a population mean, which we don't know and we do tests and we get point estimates, the population standard deviation of variance is, is really the same. It's this unknown population parameter. Now, we can assume that we know the population standard deviation in a situation where it's a, a test that may be done many, many times uh, over a period of time. So in situations of, of maybe quality control, or as we'll see here in, in this practice problem, it's testing the, the accuracy or the validity of a label that has been put on a product. This might be something where we are doing this test once a week or once a month over many, many, many years. And so having accumulated that much data over that, that time period gives us a pretty good idea of what that population standard deviation might be. So here we're going to assume it for simplification. As we go through the material, we'll relax this assumption. So what we're looking at here, let's just go through uh, our problem. We're looking at a, a local craft brewery. They, they claim that the amount of beer in the bottles is 12 ounces or 340 milliliters. So we can all relate to this, whether it's beer or it's pop or it's water. There's always that label that tells you how much of the product is in that container. And there's generally laws around the accuracy of, of those labels. Consumer protection laws mean that a producer can't advertise that this bottle contains 340 milliliters and then actually fill it with just 300 milliliters because then they would be kind of misleading the consumer and ripping off the consumer. So here we know making false claims would result in serious penalties if it overstated the true volume. So every Monday morning they take a sample of 25 bottles to test the accuracy of their filling machines. Over the past few years of sampling, they've calculated the standard deviation of the population here to be 2.1 ounces. This week, they draw a sample. It has a mean filling volume of 11.4. Are they at risk of facing any penalties? So one of the challenges that my students always face when they're doing hypothesis testing is figuring out what am I supposed to be testing for? Now, in, in this example and in all of the examples in the workbook, at least it gives you this information and it gives you a pretty good starting point of what you're testing. And here it even tells us we're doing a one tail test. And so that actually is quite helpful. But generally speaking, you wouldn't have that information probably on an exam or something like that. It wouldn't be there. And so you need to learn how to identify clues, keywords, useful information in the problem so that you know what kind of test you're supposed to perform. So this is telling us here that what we want to determine is, are they at risk of facing penalties? Well, what is it that would put them at risk of facing penalties? Well, here it tells us they would face serious penalties if they overstated the true volume. So if the label, the number on that label, if that's more than the volume that they're putting into it. So this one is a little bit tricky because of, of, of just formulating that test. So here I'm gonna state my null and my alternative hypotheses. We have the unknown population mean that we're testing for, and our hypothesized value, well, that's the number that we're testing our sample against. So our hypothesized value is this one here. 
that's the number that we put on our label. Now we are at risk if the label overstates the actual amount. And so what that means is that we want to determine if the actual amount, this number here, is it actually less than the stated amount? Because if our evidence here supports this alternative, well, this is saying that, yeah, we have evidence to show that the actual filling amount is less than what it says on the label, which is the same as saying we're overstating it. If our evidence supports the null hypothesis, well, then we can say that, no, we're not overstating it. Our evidence shows that we're filling it at least as much as what the label states. I say at least as much because this sign here, of course, means it's either equal to what the label says or it's greater than what the label says. So as a minimum, it's equal to. So that's why I would say uh, if the evidence supports the null hypotheses, we're filling it at least as much as it states on the label. So that is my test and I have just provided that justification by explaining what each of those possible outcomes means in the context of the problem. Okay, the next step, we want to calculate our test statistics. So in, in my classes, I don't ever expect students to memorize formulas. You'll have a formula sheet um, where you will have everything that you will need to be written on that formula sheet. The trick is to know which formulas to use. And as we go through the different modules, there'll be a lot of different formulas. And so it can be a little bit tricky to know which formula to use. But I don't ever expect students to memorize the formula. So that's why in this problem and in future problems, I'm just going to write down the formulas without getting into very much discussion on how they um, are derived. Yeah, that's not really going to be the focus of any of our discussions. So for this test, I need this formula for that, oops, for that test statistic sigma over the square root of n. And so now it's, again, you know, once you find that formula, it's just a matter of putting the numbers into it. And so I often will, will try to set some expectations here that step one, formulating that test, is often one of the most difficult parts of hypothesis testing because it has nothing to do with the numbers. It has nothing to do with the sample data. It has everything to do with what's written in that problem and what is our objective, what, our, what is our goal. So formulating that test is often a little bit tricky for students. Once you know what test to do, well, now we're just putting numbers into a formula. So here's my Sample mean, oops, it's not two, it's 11.4. Here's my hypothesized value is 12, divided by, there's that standard deviation, and the square root of 25. So once we have our test statistic, now we can pull up our calculator. Oh, I think I just had the answer on there already. So this is going to be 11.4 minus 12 divided by 2.1 over the square root of 25. And so that gives us our test statistic of negative 1.43. So there's our test statistic. So what is it that we've just done? So let's kind of back up just a little bit so we can see what we've done kind of in the context of what I discussed in my introduction video to this, uh, to this module. So we have a population. Now I'm not gonna draw the population here because 
we don't know what it looks like. In my introductory video, we made some assumptions just for the sake of discussion, but here I don't know what the actual population looks like. But what I do have is what my distribution looks like if my null is true, right? So if we assume that the null hypothesis is true, and here again, always true with equality, so from that distribution, we've drawn, well, from the population, we've drawn a sample, and now we compare that to our hypothesized distribution. So my sample had a mean of 11.4. Now, I don't really know where 11.4 is going to be, if that's going to be close or far away. I'm just going to put it somewhere in there in that distribution. So there's my 11.4. So now what we do, what we are doing, is we are standardizing that. We're normalizing it. So that now I can take from that assumed distribution, now we standardize it, we convert that into that test statistic, which we found was negative 143, and we found that lies somewhere I don't know, somewhere over here. Okay, so that's what we know so far. Now, <clears throat> does that support our null or does that support our alternative? In other words, what is the probability that if our null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of drawing a sample like this, oops, like this one from this distribution. So there's a couple of ways that we can go about doing this, but what we also have to be aware of is what probability are we comfortable with? We understand that if it comes from that distribution with a high probability, well, that supports the null hypothesis. If it comes from that distribution with a low probability, well, then that supports the alternative hypothesis. How do we then know whether or not it, a probability is considered high or considered to be low? Well, that is what our, whoops, that is what our level of significance is. This level of significance, this is telling me my comfort with a type one error. How comfortable am I committing a type one error? A type one error is rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. Now, again, we know that if my null hypothesis is true, we understand how this is distributed. We understand that I can draw samples from all over the place within that assumed distribution. Anything is possible. How comfortable are we believing that the alternative is true when in fact our null hypothesis is true? So when we state that level of significance, here it's given as 0 0.05. That is saying that I am comfortable with a 5% chance of believing the null hypothesis, forgive me, for believing the alternative hypothesis is true when in fact the null hypothesis is true. That number, that is the number that determines when a probability is, is sufficiently high, it supports the null. When a probability is sufficiently low, that supports the alternative. So, when we look at our results, and I see that I have a test statistic of negative 0.43. When we say, is that, what's the probability of that happening? What is the probability of this sample coming from this distribution? If that probability is greater than, sufficiently high, greater than what I have stated as my level of significance, well, then that supports the null. That says, okay, it's sufficiently likely. It's sufficiently probable.
to have come from my assumed distribution. If the probability is very low in this context, now we have that line in the sand. Now I can say if that probability is less than or actually equal to 5% or 0 0.05, well then that is when we say, okay, that probability is sufficiently low. It is sufficiently unlikely that that sample came from my assumed distribution. That is what then leads me to believe the alternative. So here I have my test statistic, negative 1.43. Now, there's different approaches to hypothesis testing, using a p-value approach or using a critical value approach. Let's do the p-value approach first, because the p-value is really obtaining the probability of obtaining, you'll hear me say this sentence a few times, the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as unlikely as the one that we've just obtained. So I'm going to go down to my Z tables, which I have down here somewhere. And I have that test statistic of negative 1.4 up here, 3. So I'm going to come down here. And there I can see is that lower tail probability. That lower tail probability is 0 0.07. Let's round it to 0 0.08. So this is saying now that this area in the lower tail is equal to 0 0.08. So that's giving me the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as unlikely, so as unlikely or even more unlikely, as the one that we've just obtained. Now, I could, if I wanted to, I could say I reject the null hypothesis. Based on this evidence, I reject it. But the reason I don't is because this number is giving me some information about my exposure to committing a type 1 error. When we look at this level of significance, this is telling me how comfortable am I committing a type 1 error. This p-value, well, we can think of this p-value like a conditional probability. If the null hypothesis is true, which I don't know, but if it is true, and if I choose to reject, this is a measure of my exposure to a type 1 error. Now, if I am only comfortable with a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error, well then I'm not going to accept an 8% exposure to a type 1 error. So because this level of exposure to a type 1 error is greater than what I'm comfortable with. And so based on that information, we do not reject that null hypothesis. Because again, with that p-value of 0 0.08, that means that my exposure to a type 1 error is greater than what I'm comfortable with. I could reject. There's nobody stopping me from rejecting. But if I do reject, my exposure to a type 1 is greater than what I'm comfortable with. And it's for that reason, then, that I am not going to reject the null hypothesis, which means, then, my comfort or my evidence supports the null. Am I correct? I don't know. Maybe I've just committed a type 2 error. And we'll talk about that in a future, in a future video. But for now, my evidence supports the null hypotheses. So if we go through now the second approach, and now we're going to verify that using the critical value approach. The critical value approach, it's entirely redundant, meaning you will always get the same conclusion using the critical value approach as the p-value approach. For my students, I often teach both approaches, not because they're necessary, because, again, they're perfectly redundant. But because it just gives practice in using the distribution tables and understanding 
that probability distribution a little bit better. So the way that this works now is that we, we consider our level of significance 0.05, and now I want to find what is the critical value, what is the z value that corresponds with alpha 0.05. So if I come down here to my z tables, now what I want to do is I want to look for this probability of 0.05. So here I'm looking around all of these numbers and I find that 0 0.05, well, it's kind of exactly in the middle of those two numbers. So this is going to be negative 1.6. But then if I follow these up, I'm going to be right between 0 0.04 and 0 0.05. So that critical value which corresponds to a probability of 0.05, this is going to be negative 1.6, and then I'm right in between here, so that's 6, 4, 5. So if I come back up to my little diagram here, well, now I see I have this critical value is somewhere over here, negative 1.645, that defines whether I'm going to reject or not. And again, these two approaches are perfectly redundant because we can see that if I have a test statistic that is larger than that critical value, as I have here, negative 1.3, it's larger than my critical value, well then, my p-value, that area under the curve, it must be larger than my level of significance because this region here, well, that is my level of significance, the area in the lower tail from 1.645. So in this case, for this lower tail test, my test statistic is larger than that critical value, which means the probability to the left of that critical value must be larger than alpha. Similarly, if my test statistic, if it was smaller than, if it was way out here somewhere, well, I can see, I hope clearly, that the corresponding probability in that tail would be smaller than alpha. So it's perfectly redundant, but again, it's good practice in using those tables um, and, and, and understanding how the probabilities and the critical values and test statistics are related. Okay, we're almost done. Last item, interpret our conclusion. Our evidence here supported the null hypotheses. We have insufficient evidence to show that they are at risk of facing penalties. Because remember, when we formulated our test, let me clean this up a little bit. When we formulated our test, and when we provided that justification for that test formulation, we said the alternative hypothesis supports that finding that the actual average is less than what it stated. And of course, it's that alternative that means they would be facing penalties. But our evidence supports the null which, of course, as we said when we justified our formulation, our evidence supports the null hypothesis, which means that the actual filling volume is at least as much as what we're stating it to be. We have insufficient evidence to show that we are underfilling our bottles of beer. Okay, that's it for this first practice problem. I hope that this was very helpful. Thank you all for watching, and bye-bye.